Get in nerds, we're playing Stellaris. Uh, today, I'm gonna try to answer a frequently asked question in the Stellaris world, which is, what do I build? And it's consumer goods. You should build consumer goods. I'm exaggerating a little bit here, but not completely. Um, so to answer this question, I'm gonna go to one of my plants, I'm gonna show you what all the, uh, what all the buildings do. And then, um, we're gonna talk about briefly build priorities and how they work. So, here's the uh, building menu. The vast majority of these buildings you're going to see here are available from the start of the game, um, but a handful of them are not, or are only available to certain civics. We do have an example of one of those here, so we are going to cover that. So let's get started here. Uh, first, what do the buildings do? Um, here's what they are. Administrative offices is your, your administrative building. It sucks up one consumer, it's got two jobs. Sucks up one consumer good per pop employed there, and produces, I believe, five administrative capacity per pop employed there. Alloy Foundries employs two pops, consumes 12 minerals, that's six per pop, and outputs three alloys uh, per pop, total of six. The Monument is next. Uh, this is a building that not every civilization gets. Some civilizations instead will get the Temple. Um, they are both the same, the Otters, the Monument, and the Temple. Um, but they, they fit that same slot. If you're spiritualist, you get temples. If you're not spiritualist, you get monuments. These consume two consumer goods per, they produce two jobs, two consumer goods per job, uh, and they output three unity and three society research per job. I believe the temple either doesn't produce, uh... I believe the temple doesn't produce any society research, but it produces amenities instead. So it'll take care of the amenities needs of your planets. As a rule, spiritualist civilizations build fewer holo theaters as a result because they're more often building temples. Um, in any case, the primary output of both monuments and temples is unity. Camel plant, we're skipping it. That's not an early game technology quite yet. Civilian industries, these are the basis of your economy. Uh, these produce, these consume six minerals per pop and output six consumer goods per pop. So, uh, and right away, I actually want to draw your attention to a thing. I don't know why they don't have the little icon in the corner for some of these, but most things will have the icon of what they produce in the corner here. So this produces alloys, this is the same as the alloys icon. So, uh, civilian industries produce consumer goods, that's the same as the consumer goods icon over here. So you can generally see what buildings produce by looking at the little corner there. Um, Moving right along, commercial zones are the first one I'm going to address that are a little different. Uh, commercial zones employ five pops. So if you've got a planet that either has or is going to have a pretty serious unemployment problem, um, commercial zones are the, the probably the easiest way to address that from the early game. Uh, there are five clerk jobs, which are worker tier jobs, unlike all of the buildings that I've addressed you with so far, which I'll... Uh, create specialist tier jobs. Commercial zone clerks are worker tier jobs. Um, they produce two units of trade value and two units of, um, and two amenities per pop. Um, now that's not a lot of output, but uh, number one, they cost, uh, they have no upkeep cost except for the energy. Uh, these buildings are all gonna cost energy as you can see here. Here. Um, all the ones we've talked about have an energy upkeep of two. But these have no; these don't consume minerals or consumer goods uh, to produce what they produce, so that's an advantage of them. Um, and they sort of don't produce consumer goods on a second level in the sense that um, all their pops are worker tier jobs, so they consume very little in terms of consumer goods, depending on the structure of your civilization that may not may or may not be useful to, to you. But for the vast majority of citizens, it is better to have five workers for your consumer goods uh, bottom line as it than it is to have five specialists or five rulers. Um, with that having been said, commercial zones are kind of an odd duck, and it doesn't tend to be viable to produce a lot of them in the early part of the game, but we'll get to we'll get to actually what should I build a little later. Holo theaters produce, uh, they cost one consumer good per pop, they employ two pops, and they output a small amount of unity, two per pop, but a, a, a positively dazzling 10 amenities per pop employed there. Uh, so they produce a lot of art, they make the planet there and happy. Luxury residences are another building that's available from the start of the game. They're also a bit of an odd duck. All they produce is housing and amenities, and they do it without employing pops. 
For that reason, it's my opinion that luxury residences and their upgrades are not generally a viable building to be constructing in the Stellaris. Um, I rarely make sweeping generalizations like that, but I will almost never build luxury residences unless, unless I am building them on a resort world. Um, some of you have seen resort world content before, I think. I think I've got some stuff up with that. But um, for those of you that have not, don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll get into the thick of it. Basically, resort worlds don't have districts, um, but they produce a lot of clerk jobs uh, from whole cloth. So uh, so the combination of those two things means you do need to build luxury residences there. Military Academy, we're skipping it because it's not an early game one. Mineral Purification Plants, we're skipping it because it's not an early game one. We'll talk about the buildings of this kind a little later in the video. Noble Estates is a special building that is available to you civilization with a certain civic. Um, in my case, I uh, my, my civilization here has a civic called Aristocratic Elite. Uh, and as you can see here, capital jobs replace administrator jobs with nobles. Some administrator jobs with noble jobs can construct noble estate building that adds additional noble jobs. Governor level cap plus one. Um, there are a bunch of civics like that. Uh, there are, I think, five. Um, there's technocracy, which replaces some of the uh, some of the administrator jobs with science director jobs. There is aristocratic elite, which replaces them with noble jobs. There is uh, what's it called? Exalted clergy or something like that, uh, which replaces them with high priest jobs. There is there's some kind of like commercial oligarchy or something like that that replaces them with merchant jobs. Um, anyway, each of those basically does a similar thing: is it takes some of your administrator jobs and it turns them into a job of a different kind that produces something slightly different and generally slightly better. Um, as you can see here, these administrators produce. Uh, a good chunk of unity. The nobles produce the same uh, the same amount of unity. The administrator produces amenities where the noble produces stability directly. Um, so the noble's going to have a much higher influence on your stability than the administrator is because the administrator is only going to add to your amenities, but the, which is going to affect your happiness, which is going to affect your stability. Uh, for those of you who've gone through the planet management video already, that's that's already you'll have a sense of that relationship. But the noble affects the stability directly, and that is much more effective. Um, so not everybody's gonna have a building like this, but you're only gonna ever have one. Um, and in some cases, I believe the merchant, uh, the, the merchant kleptocracy and the uh, oligarchy and the uh, science director at the technocratic one don't have a dedicated building uh, for these. In fact, now that I'm thinking about it, I think the Noble Estates might be the only one that's got a dedicated building now. Um, I know there was one for a time that let you build a an earlier build of the game had a different kind of administrative building that produced additional administrators, but actually now that I'm thinking about it, um, Noble Estates are the only ones, I think, with their own dedicated building. So I, I may be just sort of leading you astray on that, so I apologize. Um, most of them will not have their own building then. Uh, it's only noble states, I think. Um, I don't tend to play with those civics much. This is a little bit of a new experience for me. Um, so, you know. Uh, but if you've got one of those civilizations uh, level buildings that provides a benefit that is uh, available one per planet and provides a benefit to the whole planet, that is one of that type of building, this building, the noble states, is one of the ones you should consider when you're talking about those. Precinct houses available from the beginning of the game. They uh, produce enforcer jobs, which create a very small amount of unity. Um, however, uh, they employ two pops. And an important thing about the sorry, an important thing about the noble estates, they also provide one housing, but they only employ one pop, uh, so they house themselves. Um, but they're not going to solve an unemployment problem. Precinct houses uh, employ two pops. Um, there is no maintenance cost for the jobs that get done. They produce a small amount of unity, one per pop. But their primary outputs are one, uh, a pair of defensive armies per pop for a total of four defensive armies here. That's that icon there all the way at the bottom. <sighs> Sorry, very thirsty, friends. Um, and they reduce crime, which you could have on one of your worlds if your people are not super happy. Moving right along, there are research labs, which produce researcher jobs. These cost, uh, they employ two researchers. They cost two consumer goods per pop, and they output eight 
uh, sorry, in the output four of each type of research. So if we're going to compare this to the uh, monument up here, these produce a smaller amount of research and they only produce society research, but they also produce unity. And they cost, oops, zoom down here, the same amount of consumer goods. Whereas some of your jobs, such as your administrative office or your uh, holo theater, have a lower consumer goods cost. Um, so that should be part of your analysis as well. Um, these are the primary way you're going to get research um, in the mid game. As you're getting into the mid game, which I am here, as you can see in most of these cases under produced, you can see the breakdown of where my uh, where my research points are coming from. In all cases, about 75%, uh, maybe a little less in terms of engineering, but for, for society and physics, a very large proportion is coming from jobs in comparison to stations. And most of those jobs are research lab jobs, uh, with the exception of for society research where some of them are culture worker jobs from the monument. Uh, moving right along, we have the resource silo. This is also available from an early part of the game. It has a lower upkeep than most other buildings because it's just a big warehouse. Uh, it employs two clerk jobs, which you've seen from the commercial zone uh, building, but it adds a, res a, a 2,000 uh, resource storage capacity to your empire. Um, and that does that for each of these jobs. So what does that do? It lets you build up a bigger buffer of these things. Um, I rarely build these, but part of the reason I rarely build those is because I often stack up resource silos in all of my stations, so I get most of my resource storage capacity from those. Just some food for thought. Robot assembly plants, uh, we're going to skip that. And then uh, Stronghold uh, produces a soldier job and also houses them, so again, doesn't solve an unemployment problem but uh, it does provide a little housing, has a lower upkeep than other buildings. Uh, and the primary thing soldiers output is naval capacity and defensive armies at a higher rate than the precinct houses on a pop by pop basis. However, the precinct houses produce a larger number of defensive armies on a building by building basis. This one creates three, this one creates four. Um, however, enforcers reduce crime, whereas soldiers give you naval capacity. Um, so those are the basic types of buildings that are available to you at the beginning of the game. And there's a handful that I haven't talked about yet because they're not available uh, right from the start. And what gets you the capacity to build them is certain technologies. Most of them you will run across as the game kind of wends its way onward. So we're going to talk about those now. Generally, the earliest type you'll get are what I refer to as force multiplier buildings. These are buildings that increase a planet's capacity to produce an individual resource. Um, if you look at this planet as an example, this planet has only generator districts, so the vast majority of its planetary production is in energy. And I actually have built a building that does this, an energy grid building. Um, this produces, this has a, an upkeep that, that is the same as a building, in comparison to a district, which has lower upkeep. Um, oop, not that one, this one. Um, and it only produces one technician job, which is the name of the job that produces energy credits. However. As you can see here, we've got this little line that says energy credits from technicians plus 15%. So all of the technicians that are employed on this planet, a total of nine, uh, are gonna be producing a larger amount of energy credits total than they normally would be as a result of this building being here. Um, any planet you've got that focuses exclusively on mining, generators, or agriculture, or focuses more or less exclusively on one of those things, you're gonna want one of these force multiplier buildings once you've got it. Well, once you've got the capacity to build them. Um, I generally are gonna build them in my 10 pop or my 15 pop slot um, because I wanna take an early slot for a population growth building, which is the next type of building we're going to talk about here. Um, there are three types. Well, I should say there are two types, really. Um, one of them is the gene clinic. These produce 10% uh, pop growth. They employ two medical workers. Uh, they consume one consumer good per pop employed, so a total of two. And they also produce five amenities per pop. So uh, on, a pop or pop, on a pop by pop basis, the only way you're gonna get more amenities out of a building than the gene clinic is the Holo Theater. Um, so it's a great source of amenities. And number two, it produces pop growth, and it doesn't cost a great amount of consumer goods. Um, the other 
type available for our empire is the robot assembly plant. This consumes alloys. Um, in a previous build of the game, it consumed minerals. So if you've heard me saying that in, a, in previous games, that was correct before, but not anymore. And to be completely honest, while I think this makes robot empires a little weaker, since you tend to have a giant surplus of minerals in the middle of the game, um, or at least I do when I'm playing robots, uh, I think that having to build them out of alloys is better in terms of game balance because it puts them on the same... On, it levels the playing field with these gene clinics which, which consume consumer goods because they're both consuming a, a tier 2 resource. Um, base production of one of these robot assembly plants is two population growth of robots. And remember, so that you have a sense of what it, what, what the way it works, like the base growth of bio pops is three. Um, once you get to 100, you finish. So an assembly plant gets you a robot pop every 50 months. Base growth gets you a, ro a uh, bio pop every 33 months. Um, the other version of these that you have are for special empires. The hive mind and the uh, and the machine intelligence have their own version of these that produces uh, population growth a different way. I believe the hive mind has a spawning pool that creates population growth the same way the gene clinic does. The robot assembly plants, on the other hand, because they don't have base population growth, um, one of the jobs in their capital building is a replicator job that builds new robots, and then there's a building that, that they can build one of per planet that can uh, that creates a replicator job that does the same thing, and those jobs both operate the same way the roboticist jobs for bioempires do. Let me see, what other types of buildings are there? So this mineral purification plant, this is the same as the energy grid, but for minerals, as you can see here, it does pretty much the same thing. There's also a food processing plant, which I, in this civilization, have not researched yet. Um, so those are uh, so those are the population growth buildings. You get them slightly later in the force multiplier buildings. Well, very late in the game, there are force multiplier buildings for research and for consumer goods and alloys. Those are very, very strong buildings to have in a large late game planet, particularly in Ecumenopolis that produces a large number of those tier two goods. Um, but with that having been said, uh, I don't have access to them yet. You should generally build them. Once you're at that point of the game, you mostly know what you're doing. Um, the other types of buildings are strategic resource buildings. And I'm gonna talk about the two that I've got the options to build here, the moat harvesting trap and the chemical plant. You'll notice right away that these both have the volatile moats icon in the corner. See that there? And you've got the same thing over here. So what's the difference between these two buildings? The moat harvesting trap, uh, it doesn't say it here, but the moat harvesting trap is a harvesting building which requires a specific planetary feature. In this case, the feature we're talking about is the dust cavern. And as you can see in this icon here and in the description, maximum moat harvesting traps plus one. It is up from a baseline of zero allowed moat harvesting traps. The advantage of the moat harvesting trap, it employs, uh, it has an upkeep of one energy, it employs one worker to your pop, and it creates two uh, volatile moats per month. And as soon as I show the other one, you're going to see the enormous advantage that this one has. If we go over to the chemical plant, these are not limited on a planet by planet basis. Um, however, they have number one, a higher upkeep, three instead of one. Number two, they are employing a pop at specialist tier, but number three, as you can see there under jobs base upkeep, it costs a ton of minerals to synthesize your volatile moats. And the same is true with all the other strategic resources. It costs a bunch more, uh, a bunch of minerals to make them as opposed to extracting them from natural deposits. So wherever possible, you want to be building moat harvesting traps rather than uh, synthetic uh, moat harvesting traps or crystal mines, I've got a crystal mine here, or exotic gas uh, wells um, are generally much better to build than, uh, than these synthetic ones because they don't cost as many minerals. Um, a little bit of an odd duck over here, the military academy. This gives, uh, this employs one soldier job, um, but its primary use is actually that it increases the starting experience points of armies uh, housed on this world. Um, the fact that it employs the same number of soldiers is not significant at the beginning of the game. 
uh, where they're functionally the same, but if you get into the later parts of the game where you're having uh, the upgrades of buildings available, the military academy has no upgrade, whereas the stronghold will eventually upgrade into the fortress, which employs three soldier jobs and produces a big ol' increase in naval capacity. So that's what all the buildings do, but I haven't really answered your question, what should I build? I should tell you the obvious thing, which is you should build civilian industries to get yourself more consumer goods. Um, <laughs> again, gonna make that joke again. But actually, what should you build? Um, kind of a simple question, but also kind of a complicated question. And it comes down to the needs of both the planet that you're working with and the overall resource balances. The reason I say you should build consumer goods all the time is because it never hurts to have more consumer goods and you're always going to need more of them because generally speaking, your civilization is going to grow in population. And if it doesn't, you have got yourself a real problem um, if it's not growing and you need to look to that. And probably one of the things you're going to need to do in order to solve that is to produce more consumer goods. Um, the basic build order is planets are always going to start with a government building. Um, it's not always going to be this one. Let me see if I've got any small worlds that haven't really built up much yet. Not really. No new colonies. Anyway, it starts as a converted uh, ship engine that produces settler jobs. Then it upgrades into the planetary administration. Uh, it is always recommendable to upgrade government buildings when you can. Um, you can never build more than one of these per planet. They produce jobs uh, for enforcers and administrators, which are both decent jobs to have. It produces housing. It produces amenities. It's a generally really good building. Uh, it does take forever to upgrade, but it's more or less universally worth it. And there are uh, traditions in the tradition trees that increase its output. So that's always your building number one. You're going to unlock this slot, generally speaking, when you hit five pops. And I am almost always going to build a gene clinic there, um, if I can afford one. And this is kind of the question, this is why I say always be producing more consumer goods, is because a lot of the early things you want to build here are going to cost consumer goods, including that, uh, that gene clinic. Um, in fact, I have a not insignificant number of planets, if they didn't have strategic resources, where the first things I built were the gene clinics and then the robot, uh, the, the robot assembly plants. Um, and the reason is because continued population growth is the lifeblood of your civilization, and you want to have as high population growth as you can uh, feasibly afford to have. Um, so with that, especially in these small worlds that don't have their that don't have a lot of building slots, you want to be trying to devote as many to these important buildings, uh, these important population growth buildings as you can. Um, gene clinics are also limited to one per building, so while you can build as many holo theaters on a world as you wish, uh, you can only build one gene clinic, so you can only get that uh, population growth bonus one time. And again, because because anything that increases your population growth is really useful, uh, that's one of the things you want to generally build first before you get into other stuff. From there, once you hit your position two, uh, once you hit your, your 10 pop uh, building slot, you're going to generally be able to upgrade the you're going to be able to upgrade the planetary administration. Um, uh, your, your generally your second slot should be something related to what the planet is for. If the planet's not for anything, a great choice is robot assembly plants. Um, if the planet is for things specific though, such as harvesting uh, strategic resources, that's a good thing to build in slot number two. Otherwise, a force multiplier is a great choice, again, for some of these worlds where we're building uh, a bunch of a particular type of uh, district here. You're going to want a force multiplier building for those. Once you get to 15 pops, you unlock this fourth building slot here. Sorry, thirsty. And it's at that point that you really start to specialize a planet. It's at that point that you start to get access to enough building slots to have a planet fully specialized um, on, the, on the building level in addition to on the district level. And it's at that point that you can start really focusing on, say, outputting consumer goods. Or in some many cases, outputting... Uh, research or alloys um, so that's 
what you build when you go from there. Um, in the old world, you could only build one monument or temple per planet. Now you can build more than one. So you could build a dedicated planet that just outputs tons and tons of unity if you wanted to. Um, due to a, a mechanic called colony designation, uh, it is generally advisable to specialize planets if you can. And here is why. You've got a bunch of potential designations. As you can see, this is a generator world, but each of these provides different types of bonuses. Um, urban worlds get you reduced city district cost and increased build speed for city districts. Mining worlds get you increased output for miners and mining district build speed. Agricultural worlds get, and generator worlds get you the same bonuses, but for agricultural districts and generator districts respectively. Forge worlds get you foundry build speed and reduced upkeep for metallurgists. Ditto for industrial worlds with artisans to output consumer goods. So these are basically, they go hand in hand with each other. Uh, tech world is the same way. Faster build speed for research labs and lower upkeep for researchers. Um, and then... Those, so those are all the all the basic designations. I'm gonna go with kind of the weird ones. Refinery world is interesting. It reduces upkeep for refiners and increases uh, build speed for refineries. This is an odd duck because refineries only produce one job, which means that a world that with exclusively refineries is rarely viable, unless the world is itself very small. Um, but with that having been said, you can definitely get a lot of good work out of one of these worlds. The way I tend to do is I tend to early on build commercial zones to provide me a giant jobs buffer and then I'll start building refineries when I've got one of these refinery worlds. The next one is fortress worlds. Fortress worlds have reduced costs for fortresses but much much more importantly their defensive armies deal additional damage and they have 10% resistance to orbital bombardment. We're going to talk about how to build fortress worlds a little later but do note that this is a designation. Rural worlds are kind of funny. They have that same uh, build speed bonus for all of the districts, but there is only a five, but there is a five percent output bonus only instead of a, I think, twenty-five percent for these other ones. Let me double check on that. Yeah, twenty percent. Um, however, this is for all workers, including those clerks. Um, so if you want to build a world that's generally really large and designate a rural world early on with large numbers of district related jobs, this is what you want to do and it'll give you a flat bonus to all of these workers. Finally, bureaucratic centers are sort of a bit of an odd duck. Um, they give you reduced uh, upkeep for bureaucrat jobs uh, while increasing the output of bureaucrats significantly. Remember, as I said earlier, the baseline output of administrative capacity from bureaucrats is five per pop. This increases it by two. So those bureaucrats are going to have basically a 40% output increase. And I'm not sure, but I think it might apply that modifier before other multipliers, which are generally very high as long as you've got high stability. The other thing that the bureaucratic center does is it reduces pop ethics chance, which I think is kind of hilarious as a person who uh, has worked in what could be described as a, a, a bureaucrat job. Um, that is very real. That's a very real, uh, that's a very real modifier. Um, so last year we're going to talk about some specialized world types. Now uh, we've kind of gone over this. Um, all of what I've said already sort of applies to, to all this business. I don't tend to use urban worlds, I'm not sure what they're for. Um, but I do want to talk about the fortress world. That is something you'll find use for in some very specific circumstances. And basically, the times you're going to use those are when you've got a world that is decently sized, that is on a choke point border of another empire, such as here, if I had a world here in this system, where this empire here cannot get at me, and, and this one, well, this one can get at me through here, uh, through here. Um, but if I had one in either of these places, those would be good places for a fortress world. You see, as you get into the game, you get a technology called FTL inhibition. It contains one or more FTL inhibitors. What that means is that until the FTL inhibitor is destroyed, you cannot exit. If you're an enemy of the civilization that controls that system, you cannot exit the system via a different hyperlane than the hyperlane by which you entered it. So if an enemy comes at me here 
and I've got FTL inhibition on my station here. The enemy needs to destroy that station before they can go to this world, uh, this system, or this system. These fortresses, once you have the FTL inhibition tech, provide FTL inhibition. And it's important to understand that because FTL inhibition on planets mean that the planets need to be taken before they can go anywhere. So not only do they have to take the system, but they've actually got to take the individual planet or planets as well. Um, so how do you build up a tough planet? One way is you build a bunch of fortresses, um, strongholds and then a fortresses, which as you can see here, they produce defense armies. You can see the strength of the defense armies here. This world has two. Um, they're each 46 strength each, but they're around 50. But a fortress, which is an upgraded stronghold, produces nine defense armies. So as you can see, you can get 350 uh, defensive strength out of each, and that's a not insignificant amount of defensive strength. Now the enemy can orbitally bombard you at no risk to its own troops, and if it does that, the thing you're going to use to stop them is a planetary shield generator. I don't have access to planetary shield generators, I don't have that technology yet, but a couple of fortresses or a bunch of strongholds or priests and houses, but tend to go and watch strongholds and fortresses, and a planetary shield generator make a planet that is both extremely hard to take and extremely difficult to uh, bombard. And if you designate them as a fortress world, that additional 10% orbital bombardment damage goes a long way. You see, the planetary shield generator gives you 50% resistance to orbital bombardment. So this additional 10% that you get from this world designation is much more significant going from 50% down to 40% than it is going from 100% to 90%. Um, so that's something to think about when building a defensively minded world. Um, so yeah, that's I, I think I, I think that's basically all of it. I think I've I think we've basically covered covered what you're supposed to do. But um, what should you build? You should build consumer goods. You're never not going to need more consumer goods. Anyway, uh, this has been my uh, my little guide for, for what buildings do and how you should develop worlds. Hope that makes it easier to think about what I'm doing when you're when you're watching my uh, my let's plays uh, or or someone else's. Um, anyway, I've had fun. I hope you've had fun. I'll see you all on the other side. <laughs>